10 billion star valves, someone be between the maintainer and the Linux. Uh, so I have here a few topics ideas. So I will mention a few things about the uh, expectations about the maintainer tree and what the maintainer should do. So that you should be in the Linux next. I will share a few tips and tricks how to improve the workflow of a maintainer, including how uh, to work with the Git kernel org. There will be a few questions, I mean, a few things about the PGP case and dumping the mailing list because we should not use mailing list, maybe. Feel free to ask the questions in the middle. We have some microphones or wait till the end. I hope I will have time for the uh, questions. I mean, I should have time for the questions. Yeah, you can interrupt me. Yes. Feel free to interrupt me. Some more people are coming, so yeah, please join. Great, so who am I? Uh, my name is Krzysztof Kozowski. If you don't know how to pronounce my name because you are not a native Polish speaker, then you can say it Christoph. I go like by Christoph for foreigners. I work in Linaro in Qualcomm landing team. Uh, I maintain a few Linux kernel subsystem parts. The biggest part is device tree bindings, so I review quite a lot. Uh, I send also a few pull requests, mostly for the RMSOC guys. Why I'm talking here? Uh, because none of the upstream maintainers were complaining about my pull requests, so I think I'm doing a decent job. But more importantly, I'm sending quite a lot of patches, really, really a lot, and I noticed some patterns, and I hope that this talk might improve the uh, experience of other people who send patches to the ma to the mailing list. I will start with the integration tree and the robots. So let's imagine Schrodinger's cat, or exactly not a cat, Schrodinger's patch. So Schrodinger wrote a patch, or maybe a few patches, and sent them to the mailing list. And he received some of the answers. Imagine that Schrodinger received the answer like a thanks applied, one option, second option, the Heisenberg reviewed his patch, he received reviewed by Werner Heisenberg, or he received nothing, a silence. So mouth passes and Schrodinger gets back to his patch set and wants to see whether it was applied. And he looks at the Linux Next. Linux Next is the next integration tree for the next uh, kernel release. And he doesn't see the patch in the Linux Next. Where is it then, right? There are just 1,000 kernel org repositories with the Linux, so maybe you should check every repository or <coughs> just check 500 unique Git repositories mentioned in the maintainers tree. Obviously, if you also consider the GitHub, GitLab repositories, it's not feasible, it's not possible, right? So there can be also another case that Schrodinger prepared a patch set and some of the patches were applied or received this message, thanks applied, and then after one month, he wants to resend everything and he rebases his patch set on top of Linux Next. And then he also sees that his patch is still in the rebase patch set. So it was not applied, but he received thanks applied. So what's the problem with the Schrodinger's patch? If he received the thanks applied message, but he cannot find the patch in the Linux Next, so what shall he do? Shall he resend or shall he ping? The patch was applied. So who votes that he should resend the patch? Raise a hand. Okay, who votes that he should ping? Raise a hand. Uh, more, much more people uh, for pinging, and maybe the rest says that he should do nothing because patch was applied. Right? <laughs> uh, so if he received reviewed by, then this, and the patch is not in the Linux next, this means that obviously he should resend because reviewed means that patch was only reviewed. It was not applied. This is obvious, right? I'm talking about the real cases which I, by the way, experienced. And the third case that Schrodinger received nothing. So this is, I guess, the most obvious thing. He should either resend or he should ping and ask what's happening with the patch. So he does it. Imagine that Schrodinger pings or resends the patch and receives from the maintainer a message that, yeah, come on, I applied it. And why you are pinging me? So Schrodinger is pinging because he's confused. He checked the Linux next. There is no patch in the Linux next, so how it could be replied? And if the patch received a tag called reviewed by, it means that it was not applied, it was only reviewed. So this is the problem with the Schrodinger's in the patch. So when the maintainer takes the patch, he should then not rather call it that it's reviewed, even though while taking a patch, you are reviewing actually. When the maintainer takes the patch, 
it will be going to the upstream maintainer, eventually to the Linux servers during the next merge window. If the patch is not in the Linux next during this time, we miss quite here a lot. So there's a reduced visibility, reduced testing. So none of the bots are testing the patch. Uh, people also are testing, I'm testing Linux next. So if the patch is not in the Linux next, I will not test. Many people will not test. Eventually submitter contributor is confused and he thinks that his patch was ignored and wastes the time. And by the way, Linux also expects that patches will be in the Linux next before the merge window for a few cycles, for a few days, week, or whatever. So the solution for this is quite simple, and I'm, I'm quite surprised that uh, many there are maintainers who are not in the Linux next, because you should add yourself to the Linux next. If you ever collect patches for the upstream maintainer and the upstream, 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 whatever your cycle between you and the Linux Torvalds is, add yourself to the Linux next because it's free. I mean, uh, so Steven Roffer, who manages this, does not send invoices. It's not free from the effort, though. So, of course, if you are not a kernel maintainer, don't add yourself to the Linux next, please. Uh, add yourself if you are a maintainer. How to do it? Very simple. Send an email to Steven, uh, CCing also the Linux next mailing list, and say where is your repository, what's the name of repository, to whom you are sending, and also, most importantly, mention the one or two branches, one with the patches for the next release, for the next merge window, and the second one uh, for the pending fixes, if you have fixes for the existing release. What are the rules for the Linux Next? So if your tree is gets included to the Linux Next, you will receive the email from Steven describing few of such rules. Read the email. I will not quote the email here. Uh, more important is that you can still rebase your tree because Next is rebasable if you, as far as Linux is Linux Next is concerned, you can rebase your stuff. Uh, one important thing that some maintainers are sending the patches to the upstream maintainer, not as a pull request, but as a set of patches. And in such case, once the, your upstream maintainer takes the patches, the Linux Next will have duplicates from you and from the upstream maintainer, because applying a patch creates a basically new commit. So these are not the same commits, right? So in that case, you will receive an email from Steven that he will notice that, yeah, there are duplicated patches. So maybe you want to remove, once this happens, you want to remove the patches from your uh, for, for next branch. And one more important, or actually the most important rule here is during the merge window, you should not add the new material to the Linux next. Merge window happened like two weeks ago. I mean, this uh, Sunday it finishes. We have a, a 6.7 re release candidate first one. So during the merge window, your future next should be frozen. You should not add new material for the next tree. You can, however, still add fixes for this merge window and for the current release. So these fixes go usually to the pending fixes branch, but also they could go to your next. Linux next brings us to the testing. So the most known testing bot, so which tests everything, is the Intel Zero Day also called LKP, Linux Performance, Kernel Performance Testing. Uh, the emails are sent by kernel test robots, so these are all the same names. There are a few other bots, like uh, Kernel CI is very well known, or Linaro, Linaro Kernel Functional Testing, LKFT is also known. But the Intel Zero Day focuses on testing, on building everything. This is why I'll be focusing now, talking about the Zero Day here. So if you ever apply patches and you have a kernel org repository, then probably a uh, kernel test robot already builds your patch, uh, builds your tree. If you have repository in some other tree like GitHub, but you are in the Linux next, then you will also be built just with a one day delay. I mean, when the next release happens, Linux next release. If in, you have other case, so you are not in the kernel org, or you are not included in the LKP, then the bots will not find your patch, right? And this, this leads us to the previous talk that if you are not in the Linux next, then sorry, no one is testing your, uh, your, your commit. And it's quite easy to add yourself to the LKP. And there is a benefit even if your repository is in the kernel org. Why? Because you can say which branches you want to test and you can receive more detailed notifications, what is test, what is being tested, what is being built, uh, success for every build or failure for every time. So I actually encourage it, even if you have kernel org repository. 
And you could add your development tree, which is, for example, on GitHub or so somewhere as well. So this is my case. I have my uh, maintainer trees on kernel.org and development trees on GitHub. And whenever I push something to GitHub, I receive the emails from the kernel test robot that, yeah, everything is fine, build was success. And this kind of saves me the public, maybe not humiliation, right? But let's say public messages from a kernel test robot that I introduced a warning in this patch set because I will get it earlier when I push, after I push to the GitHub account. How to do it? There's a GitHub repository for the LKP and uh, you just have to add there a new repo file and I mean, add a new one or edit existing one if there's a one for your entry for the kernel org account. And just look for the examples so you can check other how the other people add the, the repo file for themselves. So check for existing pull request. There's a bit more extensive wiki because this repo file describing the repository for LKP has some uh, arguments, some configuration options, so you can customize it. So I encourage you to go to the wiki or the questions and then uh, check how to do it. So uh, what was the question? Can you repeat? It's still free beer, right? Yes, free beer, yeah. So, so it's yeah. still coming for free as a free beer. Uh, and so far, the LKP guys never said that it cost them something. Obviously, it cost them compl computation power, but they don't complain if you add your okay. tree there. Maybe after this talk, they will start complaining, but then it <laughs> So it's still free beer. Yeah. Next topic will be the applying patches. So. I wish like we have one tool which will help you apply the patches from the mailing list and that people will not look for uh, for the patch, look for the tag which they receive, then download the patch, get commits, so, so on, so on, so on, right? So many people use different tools, different setups, complicated workflows like a patch for client or mod or saving the patch and then git am. So whatever workflow we are using, quite likely B4, which is a new tool, does it better. So I encourage anyone who handles the patches through the mailing list or mailbox to switch to the B4. B4 is a, a Python package, so it's in PIP, but also it's in the distro repositories. What are the benefits of the B4? First of all, it creates really nice thank you emails. I will also say a few things about the thank you emails. It can integrate with the patchwork, at least with the kernel org patchwork. I'm not sure whether it integrates with the free desktop and the DRM guys patchwork. It can apply entire series or individual patches. And one, once applying the patches, it automatically collects the reviewed by, tested by, and act by tags and adds a nice link to the Linux kernel mailing list discussion. And all this comes automatically. Before also detects newer versions. So if you, by any chance you apply older version of the patch set from the mailing list, it will find that there's a new one and it will grab the new one. There's also a nice comment before diff, which allows you to compare the versions of the patches, patch sets. So V3 will be four, for example. And there are quite more. So I encourage you to read more uh, at the Constantin. So on the last, last plumbers or two years ago plumbers, Constantin gave nice talk about the before and the lower. So just go there and he explains a bit more. Before has a very simple configuration. So in your kernel org repository or your maintainer repository, you just have to add one section for the thank you emails, if you want the thank you emails. And if you want the patchwork integration, then there are a few more comments. Once you do it, you just run the to apply a patch before Shazam. Here I want to have the uh, the trailers from the cover letter, which means that I want to have all the reviewed, tested by, act by tags from the cover letter. If someone responds to the cover letter, then I want to have them. I want to add the link to the kernel mailing list. And finally, I want to add my sign off, dash S, and I give the message ID. So before we'll grab the thread from the uh, Laura kernel org, I will mention what is Laura kernel org at the end of this talk. Finds the patches, applies them, and because because I have integration with the patchwork, it also updates the, the patchwork state. So the, after applying the patches, the patches are becoming under review on the patchwork and they will get accepted once I send the thank you emails. 
So why am I speaking about the thank you emails? I mean, why do we need thank you emails? First of all, to thank you, because it's a nice way to do. Uh, but also it brings the confirmation that the patch was applied, which is partially solving the problem with the Schrodinger's patch, but not yet fully. And the third thing that you can put the useful information, like the link to the Git repository when it, where it was applied or the name of the branch. So the Schrodinger can check that his patch was applied here and you can see, yeah, the patch is there, even if it's not even in the Linux next. How to send a thank you? Assuming that you pushed your repository, your for next branch to, uh, to your repository, you can list the thank you candidates with dash L and then send them with dash A dash S. So this will automatically send thank you letters to everyone from which you applied the patch. <laughs> You can customize the thank you email. You can add a more complex template. So for example, if you look at the uh, Neil Armstrong or Mark Brown emails, their thank you emails, they're quite big instruction how, what will happen with the patch. So not only information that the patch is applied here, but also what will be the next step. You can also do it by, uh, if you wish. There are a few more useful options for the before. So once again, I refer here to the, uh, to the docs. The, Applying patch, we cannot keep one important thing, which is the sign off. So this is, this is not well known by every person and even maintainers get it wrong. But when you apply a patch from the mailing list, the DCO, so developer certificate of origin, requires you to put your own sign off. And sometimes people get it wrong. And if you do it wrong, you will receive an email from Steven, and your tree is Linux next. You will receive an email from Steven, and Steven will say that's missing sign off. You can avoid this email by adding a hook to your own repo. This hook will use a script. In my case, I took Greg K script, verify sign off. And there's a link here to them, to that script. And the script will check whether the signed off is proper, is, is correct person. You can avoid yourself email from Steven later. Another useful commit hook would be the one which checks the fixes tag. So the fixes tags in the Linux kernel is we annotate that we have a fix for another commit and we point the SHA of the other commit. So in that case, we want to fix here some, uh, some commit like this from the RM tree. And one of the problems which appear from time to time is that you apply a Maintainer applies the patch and then later applies the fix for this patch. And there is a reference, so fixes, one commit points to the fixed, fixed commit. And then the rebase happened. If rebase happened, the original commit, which introduced a bug, changes. I mean, the, the commit shy is a different one. Therefore, the fix points to the different tag. And this is a really issue. If you check the mailing list, Steven sends like a few, uh, few emails per month that the fixes tag points to the wrong commit. Again, you can spare yourself email from Steven and use a script which does it for, for you. So I took the script from uh, Greg Cage again, who probably took it from Steven as well, I guess. And this tag, uh, this script will check whether the tag, the fixes tag is correct in your case. Now, the script checks a few things. First of all, with the commit, proper commit SHA, but more important, whether this is the ancestor of of the commit which you are now doing, right? Because when you create a fix, I mean, some, you apply a fix from someone, you should fix a commit in your tree. You are not going to fix someone else branch, right? It's always in your branch. There are very rare cases that you have to do it differently. Now, why I'm speaking about the commit hook? Because two scripts can be employed, can be put together in a commit hook, which will do it automatically whenever you apply a patch. And such hook could look that's simple. You put them in some tools repo, or you reference this tools repo. Uh, first, you run the verify sign off, and then you write verify six, uh, fixes. I took this idea of the comment hook actually from Lee Jones, who is here. Uh, he was using it for check patch. So I reference here the full hook which I have. And so customizing is very simple. You just uh, have to point the path to the repository with this verify sign off, verify fixes tag. You copy the hook to your Git uh, repository to the post apply and post commit, which means that the hook will be executed <coughs> every time you apply a patch or every time you commit or rebase. So this will detect all the change, also cases where you rebase your tree and introduce new troubles with this. 
The hook doesn't fail the process, so you can still ignore the feedback if you want to, if you are sure that it's all good. So how does it look like? So this example here, I amend the commit and I introduce the mistake. The hook starts. I have also check patch in my hook. Uh, then the verify sign off script is executed and he detects that the author is Raymond, but the committer is me, Christoph, and the sign off is obviously missing. Eventually, he also, the, the hook runs the verify fixes tag. And the process is not cancelled. I mean, I can ignore the output if I wish to. Or I, you can change the hook up to you. Right on schedule. Next topic I want to talk about the Git repository on the kernel org. So if you ever have the kernel org account, which might be a bit minority here, uh, you know that you can customize the about page. So this is the Git web interface of the kernel org. And by default, this about page displays the readme of the Linux kernel repository, which is quite pointless because there is really no point everyone to read the readme of the Linux kernel. But you can put there a bit more information about your tree. So who is going to pull, what is the point of this tree, few things, uh, whatever you wish to put there. Like I put usually name of the branches. We have it described on the kernel org docs. Uh, the process of editing it a bit awkward. You have to edit some meta ref. You can do it either in the Linux kernel repository, which you are now uh, changing, or create entirely different repository for this meta refs, up to you. There's a full guide on the kernel uh, docs account. The next topic I would speak with the res uh, respect to the kernel org is the transparency log. So the transparency log recalls all the git receive operations the kernel, the git repository receives. And this is on the kernel org and this touches, this concerns all of the repositories. We have a nice big exp uh, explanation on the kernel org docs, but let me show a bit here. So, because first of all, you can browse the transparency log by yourself through the uh, Git repository because it's published, but is it, this is public inbox format, so you can view it also in your browser. You have to set up the public inbox on your computer, which is a bit, I mean, tricky, but once you do it, you can see something like this. So this is the transparency log for the kernel org account and we see here that there were several post receive hooks and different people were pushing different things to their repositories on the kernel org point of this transparency log is to have a proof possibly like an audit that people were pushing something and yeah this commit got there because someone pushed this commit to the kernel org if you investigate one entry here so this is the net def entry you will see the repository we changed which user, so this is probably Dave Miller because this is the name of his account. And what was the change for the actual uh, name of the branch, I mean, the, the shards of the branch. And this was a plain push. But I want to speak here more is about the, using the sign pushes. So even the kernel org docs are saying that there are cases that someone could impersonate or could have access, backend access to the uh, kernel org infrastructure. Therefore, even the kernel org docs encourage people to use the signed pushes. Signed pushes means that the push is signed, not the commit. And hoping that every maintainer uses already signed tags, therefore he has a, a GPG key on a smart card, it should be pretty straightforward, right? Because everyone has the key on the GPG, I mean, on the smart card. If you have such case right then uh, signing a push would be just a question from the uh, from the push that yeah they want to unlock the smart card and that's it if you sign pushes and then look at the transparency log you will see a bit more information so this is now example different i'm showing different entry the repository is from greg karmisk uh, the user is still greg cage but below there are new entries saying that the sign was pushed and this is what signed with the certificate. And we know that certificate is from the Greg. So this allows <laughs> us to be sure that no one from other, from Linux Foundation, IT admins, whatever, no one else pushed this, unless of course they have the certificate from Greg. This leads us to the interesting topic, which are the PGP keys or GNU PG keys. Why do you ever need them? So if you are a maintainer, then hopefully you send a pull request to your upstream maintainer with the signed tags. 
because you should not use branches. Branches are mutable. You should use the tags. And if your repository is not on a kernel org account, but it's on somewhere on the GitHub, then Linux expects to use the signed tags. So she will reject your pull request if you don't use the signed tag. If you want to participate in the kernel org transparency rock, you also need the signs. So these are both reasons why do you need the PGP key. One of the problems with the PGP key is that we expect them to be signed by some, someone else. So the usefulness of the PGP key pretty often uh, comes with that it has some signature of someone who we trust. But it's not exactly true because there is a usefulness of the every key even if there are no signatures on it. There's a trust on first use, for example. And if you want to participate on the web of trust, then of course uh, you need to collect the, start and collect the signatures. If you want to get the kernel org account, you also need to start collecting the signatures of your PGP key. We have a very extensive guide describing how to set up the PGP keys, including the smart card. So I will not be going through it, don't worry. Uh, there's quite a lot of topics there. So go to the guide if you uh, want to hear the details. But the important part here is that we want also to sign the keys because we want to build the web of trust. And usually we sign the keys in person. So this conference is a good idea. Uh, but we have also a map of kernel developers. Go to the map and find someone, a kernel developer near you and go for the beverage of your choice. Uh, signing usually happens, I mean, with signing in person, then you have to print the key. It has to be full fingerprint. I was organizing a signing event in the previous conference in uh, Linaro Connect, and some people came with the cut fingerprint, I mean, not full finger. Uh, you also should show your ID because you want to verify the person. And then once it's done, the other participating party will send you the signatures for your key. But you don't have to do it only in the in person. I mean, pandemic came and we stopped meeting each other. So there's a process for a virtual, I mean, remote signing key. So you can do it through a video conference call. The tricky point with the signatures is that once some person signs your key, only you and this person have this actual signature of your key. In the past, we are exchanging some signatures for the key servers, but it's not possible anymore. You cannot share the, I mean, you could try to share it for the key server, but you shouldn't because some of the key servers strip the signatures, so then you cannot. And the ones who don't strip the signatures, you should not use them. So that's why you should, this is not the way how to exchange the key signatures anymore. The only way to exchange the signatures for the kernel org community is uh, through the kernel org keyring. So we have a Git repository for this. And okay. First, Kevat, that if you want to add yourself to the kernel org for sharing the signatures, you have to be already a kernel org contributor. So again, it comes for free as a free beer. It doesn't come as a free of effort. So feel free to add your key with the signatures to the kernel org account if you are a regular kernel org contributor. There's a bigger guide there, but if you don't want to read it, it's as simple as exporting the public part, the PGP key, with the signatures and sending into the mailing list. The mailing list is public. The second caveat uh, is that uh, you already need to have two signatures on your key to be there accepted. So we have a kind of way to uh, avoid unnecessary work. Next topic would be dumping the mailing list. So there's a pro nice project called Public Inbox. If you never heard of it, it's the way to archive or store the mailing list uh, in a Git repository for people to access and also expose some front end to this mailing list archive. Lay is the command line tool, local email interface. Lorekernel.org is the web server which exposes the, the mailing list uh, for this public, in, uh, public inbox. So one, why do we need it? Because the mailing lists are way overwhelmed. I mean, uh, I'm not subscribed to the mailing lists anymore, and I just propose to drop them entirely. Uh, with the public inbox and this lay interface, you can follow the mailing list without being subscribed. 
And you can even customize it better because you can follow specific topics. So maybe you are not interested in the entire part of the Linux kernel or you are only looking for some drivers. There's a, again, I'm referring to the talk of Konstantin. So he described both before and uh, Laura and Lay. So there are a bit more details in this in his talk. Sorry, you sure. Yeah. The slides are also available on the uh, LPC events website. So I have here a lot of slides because I would also like this to be kind of reference for you, for your work, whatever. So uh, grab the slides afterwards uh, if you need. So uh, the lay is the command line tool, which will talk with the specific server. And the benefit of the lay is that it can download the emails based on your search query and put them, for example, on the IMAP server. So this is in my case, I store them on the Gmail account. Uh, the credential for the Gmail account then are taken from the Git credentials. So the same credentials which you are using for sending emails or uh, other ways of interacting with the Git. But you can also store the output of the lay. So all the emails that lay downloads, you can store them in mail if you use MAT or other local email client. This is the example of the search query, how to use the lay. So, I use it from the server called lorekernel.org because these are the mailing list for the Linux kernel mailing list. I use the outputs as my Gmail uh, account and I put them under the specific folder, lkmldt. And the bottom is the search query. So I'm interested in the mailing list called device three. Once I set up such search query, I just keep updating it from cron or whatever other scripts or uh, ways you run lay up, and this will get fetch all the emails which appeared recently since the last run. And you can customize it even better because you can look for specific files. Like if you are interested in specific driver like UFS Qualcomm, you can use the DFN, diff file name keyword. And this way you can really get some pieces of the Linux kernel discussion which is interest for you. If you want, if there's no dedicated mailing list for the subsystem, like for regulators, you can also look uh, for the subsystem in that way, also with the search query. So also with the DFN, diff file name. There are more resources for this. So the, there's a LWN article describing the lay and the LoRa, and there's extensive help of, for all the search keywords. There are more search keywords which you can use to uh, get the mailing list on your computer. This is the end of the talk. So I have here references. So this is why you get the slides later. I just, all the links which I was talking here, all the scripts which I might be useful for you, they're all here. And just grab them later for the for usage. And maybe we have some questions. Okay. Yeah, that's okay, so okay, so the scripts people tend to run have become more and more agreed, I think, over time. So I run a very similar set of scripts to you. Um, do you think it's time that we actually did push a few more of those into the main kernel repository so they're always available? Or are people just going to carry on arguing about it? I think it would be cool. I have <laughs> I mean, many maintainers have their own workflows, right? But uh, if you are starting your your task as a maintainer and handing some patches, then it's quite a lot of work to set up this workflow. So it would be useful if there is something already there which automates all the checks, all the things which you should do as a maintainer, as a someone who handles the patches in a, the, the process of handling. So yeah, in the kernel org. Yeah, I have the same ancestor fix you do. So. <laughs> There's one big question. Yeah. Okay. So I'm one of those maintainers that should switch to before. And I was wondering, is there any like testing infrastructure that I could use before running before with uh, uh, <laughs> real mailing lists? A lot of the options provide dry runs. A lot of the options, a lot of the uh, scripts provide dry runs. So you can run it, get the output before actually submitting it to anyone publicly. Rest for you. No, I'm good. 
I was going to say, in addition to the dry runs, you can configure uh, like the thank yous to just pipe out to a mail, and then you can send it with get send email. So you can you can add as much sanity checking. Like I send mine to myself, make sure I've actually sent the mail correctly, and then I actually send it to the people I want to. And you can do all kinds of verification. So yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, and with the before also you can save the thank you emails and don't send them by before, but uh, look at them and send them with git send email by yourself, for example. Hey, Christoph. Uh, thanks for introduction to B4 tool. Um, does it support multi-factor authentication method uh, for emails? Uh, so before it's only the command line tool. And to send the emails, it will use whatever the credentials are set in the uh, git config file. So if the git send email, I think, supports the, I think it doesn't support. So then the answer will be rather not. I don't know. OK. and. Uh, so to download the series of patches, uh, it supports uh, Patchwork Server 1.0 and 2.0, both versions. PW Client script doesn't seem to support Patchwork version 1. So which Patchwork is supported? Then uh, that's a good question. I know that it works well with the Patchwork for the kernel org account. But do, I guess we are now referring to the other. Yeah, um, other. Let, let's say company has internal uh, Patchwork server running. I don't know. <laughs> okay. I know that it doesn't work well, I think, with the free desktop org uh, patchwork. So, unless someone wants to correct me. Oh, sure. Yeah, so we have been using uh, patchworks internally, and I've been using before, uh, at least in my workflow. It does seem to work okay. In the interim, the other thing you can do, it's just Python, and it's all open source. So you can just hack before if it doesn't fit your exact needs, too, which I've done because they're just like, everyone wants to do their own little workflows. So you can just do whatever you want. It's Python. Question? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> about the getting your keys signed. You said that there's an opportunity to do that here in the conference. Uh, here, I mean, we don't have GPG. dedicated. What? Key signing event, but feel free to approach me and uh, or we can do it after this session if there's the time. Okay, or... so I don't think I'll be ready. But, <laughs> so when's the next opportunity to have a key signed? Or, I mean, there, is it really only in person? That seemed a little odd, but I was just checking. No, no, you can do it uh, through a video call. So then you have oh, to. Oh, okay. So set long up as they can who see a real key, key. Yes. you're not a bot. Or you can hang out for a, grab someone on a coffee, right? But then you find a person who is trustworthy to sign your key. I mean, like, a, because obviously you don't want to have signatures on your key from random John Smith, right? You want someone who is important in this uh, web of trust. So you have to find <laughs> such person, invite for a beer, coffee, and then. I was sign. important once, but I'm not important anymore. So, <laughs> but uh, should so we should we we just should contact individuals, for example, yeah. Whatever. Or let's organize it for the on the next conference, like uh, embedded open source summit. Oh, okay. So it doesn't summit. have to be the next Linux plum, plum, plum. or next Plumbers. Yes. If, you, if you do get organized in time, just post on the hallway track um, and say, "Yeah, is anyone about?" And I'm sure someone will reach out and say, "Yeah, sure." Oh, oh, okay. If they can find the stuff to do it. So what you need for the key signing is to have it printed, and that's the only <laughs> fully printed <laughs> fingerprint. Question here. Um, a comment, there's, um, B4 also supports sending through a B4 relay. We have a relay service running on kernel.org that will actually, if you don't have an email server that, that is good to configure with Git, can send email, like it doesn't do SMTP or your company does weird things like replaces all the links with, uh, you know, weird sanitized ones or adds huge disclaimers at the bottom. So we do, you can, you can send B4 relay that goes through kernel.org and will do the right thing with the patches. It's very easy to configure with before uh, prep and before send. Yeah, I focus on this talk on the maintainer aspect of the before, but before is quite a big tool and it has a lot of a lot of useful features for the contributors. So whenever there is a person asking how to send a patch, I would say, yeah, don't do this like my way. Git format patch, git an email, use before because it's uh, yeah, it's better. Yeah, if you do hack before, do send it back to me because I want to see the hacks that you're doing. I'm, I'm the author of Before. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions?
Oops. As a question. Constantine, can you throw it back pass? behind you? Thanks. Uh, so I saw that you used a Gmail there. Um, I know like six months ago or a year ago or something, they changed how you authenticate. And I had to go dig around on GitHub to find a tool. Uh, I don't know. What do you use to authenticate if you send patches? Or um, you know, what does anyone else here use? So I do use still Gmail. And I use the to fact authentication, but the password generated for the application. So this password is stored in the Git credentials. So this, uh, therefore, it's not like a plain text in your, in your, uh, I don't know, uh, home directory, but it's stored in the, in my case, in the lib secret of the GNOME. I mean, whatever desktop there is, and Git credentials get to this secret, and then it gets to the passwords application. Right. Uh, I just when I have to, whenever I have to send an email, I have to like run an application, and then I have to click a link and open it in the browser, and then copy something back in. So I was just wondering if anyone else was you know using gmail to send patches and they had a better tool to use for that the answers on the <laughs> can you pass them the mic uh, so i'm with google so i'm like forced to use gmail to some extent um, <laughs> the way i hacked around it is i have a chrome extension that i have binded to a key that grips the message id out of it and copies it to my clipboard <laughs> <laughs> But it works. It's amazing. Uh, it's just that it seems kind of a you know a one-off solution that I'm using. It's like you know some Go app that I found on GitHub, and I don't know how many users it has. Or maybe there's a more streamlined way. Because I, I do have like the app set up and you know, like I log into the app and it asks me twice, do I really want to log in? Uh. <clears throat> yes. Well, yeah, until it expires. The which is... So on the topic of B4, uh, you discussed from a maintainer's perspective, but uh, I'm wondering if we can make it more usable from a reviewer's perspective as well. So what I kind of do is a B4AM, and then I get the thread in my local uh, inbox, and then I start uh, editing through MUT or something and review the patches. So instead, some integration with B4 where you can uh, directly fetch the latest series or, you know, I mean, before diff and all is useful that way to check diff between revisions. But uh, to have a before reviewed by where you can simply, you know, automate the reviewed by uh, process, uh, is that something we can consider? Yeah, I guess the idea goes there too. <laughs> that man, <laughs> Constantine. I think it's good. Yeah, good idea. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much.